It's season six, the most mysterious season of The Simpsons ever. But the real mystery is what are the best episodes from this killer lineup? So let's solve the case. I took all 25 episodes, laughed the clip show out of the room, and then eliminated six more to get our 18 semifinalists. Yeah, 18 of them. It's one of those years. Then I eliminated them one by one until I got finalists that I could live with. So here are my top 10 episodes from season six. Sideshow Bob Roberts serves as a refreshingly original take on a Sideshow Bob Revenge story. That is not about attempted murder or him trying to blow everyone up. He had mentioned his politics before, so it's organic to have him seize power by running against Quimby. Why murder the Simpson family when you can make their lives a living hell? I think this episode has a lot to say about the power of messaging. How someone like Homer could be drawn to a right-wing personality like Birch Barlow. How these personalities and media companies can control a narrative. That in politics, perception really is reality. This has got to be the most pathetic and incompetent Mayor Quimby has ever been. He kind of deserves what he gets for relying on these kids for campaign advice. Maybe the children aren't our greatest resource after all. The mystery doesn't kick in until halfway through, so that angle is never going to be as deep as something like Black Widower, but it does provide a lot of drama, intrigue, and homages to famous films. Also, we get that Riverdale situation, which is a mystery in itself. Yeah, the depiction of the Republican Party is really over the top. I'd imagine most conservatives really hate this one. But I think the cartoony portrayal is the right play here, considering the cartoony villain involved. Sideshow Bob Roberts might not be the most focused episode in the world, but the charisma of its guest star once again carries the day. Homie the Clown is making this list because of its jokes. Nobody watches this one because of its intricately plotted story, as cool as that bicycle callback is. Clowning is all about big, broad comedy, and they certainly succeeded with their character writing. Krusty is at his crustiest, burning through cash like it's nothing, merchandising like his name means nothing, and winning nothing via his stupid wagers. His wordplay is pretty good though. We get the most impressionable version of Homer ever, followed by an impressively miserable and incompetent version of him. Oh, and did I mention he almost kills a man? Homer worked himself into a shoot. The Mafia is completely and utterly useless here, basically drawing things out for the sake of the plot, but it works for this farce of a story. They insert just enough danger into the story to give it stakes without ever ruining its mood. Sure, let's shoot Ned Flanders in the chest. He'll be a good sport about it. In a season with so many dangerous, life and death situations, Homie the Clown's lighter and more ironic approach is greatly appreciated. Homer the Great is a wonderful romp through the world of secret societies and Homer's deep fear of being excluded. You hear whispers about Freemasons and stuff like that, and wonder if there's some big secret going on behind the scenes, some power structure we don't know about. I love how the stonecutters are portrayed that there is this big historical backstory and social hierarchy, but for all the prophecies and sacred parchments and stuff, they're basically a college fraternity. Casting Patrick Stewart as the leader is a genius move. He really brings that air of sanctity to a character that's basically organizing a party and leading them in a memorable song. This portrayal of the Stonecutters pairs really well with Homer's personal journey, that Homer desperately, desperately wants to belong. When you feel like you're being excluded, it does feel like there's some kind of conspiracy you need to get to the bottom of. This episode has one of the best character journeys of the entire season, giving him exactly what he wants and then turning it around on him. His real mistake was obviously listening to Lisa, though. Painting that building sky blue was also a pretty bad call in hindsight. Homer may never be a member of the esteemed No Homers Club, but his story did make it into this countdown. So I guess that's something. Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 1 is one of the very few episodes I watch primarily for its atmosphere and drama. Now I'm not saying there aren't any laughs in it, it's just there's a heaviness to the comedy here where they're less apt to lampshade things or decompress a dramatic moment with a joke. Homer going crazy and shaking Mr. Burns is funny in general, it's a little less amusing seeing him get dragged away screaming. It's been said that one's true character comes out during difficult moments, and I think we're getting a lot of that here. A lot of the characters are pushed to the brink by Mr. Burns, we see a bitterness and ruthlessness we don't often see. 
Sure, Bart will break Mr. Burns' windows, but we wouldn't typically see him charge at the guy. Because of the mystery, the writers have to spend a lot of time building up motives, which results in an episode jam-packed with compelling character moments. Also, the mystery is well-constructed and has lots of clues, yada yada yada. It is happening again. I've spent dozens of hours looking at screenshots from this episode, so this relatively lower ranking is mostly because I'm burnt out on it. Yet somehow, I can still feel the excitement and intrigue of Who Shot Mr. Burns all these rewatches later. Its sense of atmosphere is unmatched by any other episode. Man, I love how epic Bart's Comet is. There just aren't many Simpsons episodes that threaten to kill the entire town. It's like a streamlined and condensed Simpsons movie. I really like how the Simpson family is integrated into this big macro story. It's not like Bart causes everything to fall apart, like Homer in the movie. He's just the first to discover it. They can tell the story from the Simpsons' point of view in an organic way, without them having to be the hero of the whole town or something. The story gets at the limitation of what people can actually do in this kind of crisis, how we can make things worse or better for each other. Like buy all the toilet paper for no apparent reason. Bart's Comet becomes more of a character study than a puzzle that needs to be solved. The Simpsons love the general idea of, sometimes you just can't win, this story is a nice application of it. Yeah, the Ned Flanders stuff starts up super late, but this is a good vehicle for getting a lot of our major characters together to do what they do best. We get such a heartwarming moment at the end, I don't mind that Flanders skips Acts 1 and 2. They gave us the weather balloon callback, this ending is cohesive enough. In the end, Bart's Comet teaches us that being an aggressive jerk saves everyone's lives, and to downplay and not worry about major crises. Basically, don't listen to Bart's comment. Lemon of Troy has that perfect mix of focused adventure elements and that easygoing hangout vibe. They'll establish the town history and the big importance of the lemon tree, get us all pumped up to see the kids investigate Shelbyville. But there's always this sense that the whole fight is incredibly stupid and pointless, and the kids aren't really in any serious danger. Well, most of the time. The kids are super focused on their end goal, but don't really know how to execute it. So Act 2 gets filled with these wonderful little character vignettes. I would watch an entire series about the adventures of Nelson and Martin. I know a good theme song they could use for it. Millhouse is portrayed as delightfully insecure, culminating in a surprisingly emotional showdown with the other Millhouse. The story is well structured too, not just for all the callbacks, but how they integrate the parents into it. They'll show up in the middle and sort of lag behind the plot, and by the time we need to escalate things, we can bring the groups together. I don't think the climax would be as good if it were just a showdown between the kids. Their point about town history wouldn't be as strong. They do a nice job letting Bart be the clear protagonist here, but not forgetting what Homer can bring to a story. Lemon of Troy is the master of changing up its dynamic, always showing us something new. When the plot gives you lemons, make jokes about lemon-shaped rocks. As The Simpsons' first futuristic episode, Lisa's Wedding gives me exactly what I want. We have wacky and anachronistic jokes, hilarious predictions of future events, and tiny little glimpses at our favorite characters. It's got that surprise factor of, oh, Moe has an eye patch. Mr. Burns got stabbed 17 times, Quimby is driving for Otto. It's all super casual, just giving us those quick little answers without going into detail. This is one of my favorite portrayals of Lisa as a character, how they give her a love interest like Hugh that appeals to her know-it-all and snobby tendencies. You know, everything the internet seems to hate about Lisa. We get that culture clash, where she doesn't know exactly how to react to Hugh's parents, and for Hugh, it's even worse. Homer is written so over the top that it's understandable why Lisa would feel humiliated. Despite this, the story is smart enough to let Lisa's love for her family be unspoken, especially when it comes to her father. It sprinkles in plenty of sweet moments between she and Marge, but it relies on the continuity and goodwill built up between Lisa and Homer. By the time he delivers that beautiful speech to her, we are totally on board. We already know what these two characters mean to each other. It doesn't feel forced or contrived. 
For six seasons, the show had put so much thought and effort into its characters and their relationships. Lisa's wedding feels like the perfect payoff for all that hard work. I think Homer Badman is one of the most stressful episodes of The Simpsons ever. Homer spends the majority of it completely miserable and helpless, and Ashley Grant is understandably upset by the situation. It's easy to be like, come on, figure this out. But the whole thing with the gummy Venus de Milo is so ridiculous and implausible that of course you would come to this conclusion. It's this horrible trap that you wish they could all escape from. That being said, this episode is filled to the brim with hilariously silly moments. Gummy enthusiasts will love the gummy-focused humor, as well as the gummy-adjacent jokes not about the gummy sciences. But Act 2 is where this thing shines. We get the protesters at the plant, Homer roasting in his own juices, under the sea, and rock bottom. The media satire is perfectly executed, taking clear aim at trashy tabloid programs and 24-7 non-stop coverage. They're right, there is so little substance that you could have a bear host one of these shows. Actually, I would probably watch Gentle Ben's human interest stories. I think I'm part of the problem. My only knock against it is its deus ex machina ending with Willie. He does come completely out of nowhere. But it's basically impossible to disarm this trap otherwise, and he does fit in with the overall satirical message. So I'm giving it a pass. If there's anything Homer Badman taught me, it's to always trust what I see on television. Do it for her. You all knew that this was going to rank pretty high because of that emotional ending. You know me and my addiction to sugar, top 5 was basically a lock. The ending gets all the love, of course, but I think its sense of humor deserves just as much praise. There are some absolutely killer jokes in here. Stuff like Homer playing Mr. Burns like the bongos, Homer's shenanigans at the bowling alley, the marketing montage. Then we have the entire sequence after Patty and Selma find out about the pregnancy. Right from when they open the phone book to the moment Homer screams, it is like the most perfect two minutes The Simpsons has ever put together. In addition, they get a lot of mileage out of the story being told in flashback. The other ones have the advantage by being such distinct period pieces. The only thing this one has is Dr. Hibber's haircut. Homer screwing around with the story really sets this one apart. Maggie has always been underutilized by the show, often totally forgotten by the plot. The Homer-Maggie relationship is way less defined than Homer-Lisa. You're never going to get a nuanced relationship story here. But that's okay, the episode understands that limitation and works around it. Ultimately, And Maggie Makes Three does an awesome job portraying Homer's unconditional love for his daughter and the sacrifices he has made for her. Want to know why I didn't put Trials of Horror 5 in a Simpsons showdown? Because in my book, it would wipe the floor with anything it went up against. It's kind of crazy how easily the Simpsons slipped their way into a parody of The Shining. It's almost like they built their characters just so they could get them in these roles. There is obviously that manic and aggressive side to Homer's personality, so it's easier to get that desired blend with his usual dopiness. It's got some of the best character animation in the entire series. Not just for how they get the Kubrick eyes and the homage right, but all these facial expressions. The animation and performances really carry this segment. Time and Punishment is the sort of oddball here, less of a traditional horror story and more of a sci-fi adventure. It works well as a lighter change of pace for the other two segments. It's much bouncier, hitting us quickly with one absurd situation after another. We get the best material out of a Ned Flanders dystopia without spending eight full minutes on it. There isn't even the danger of the audience growing frustrated by time travel mistakes, because we all kind of expect Homer to bungle it. This is a guy who can't even keep his hand out of the toaster. Finally, we have Nightmare Cafeteria, which in my opinion is the scariest Trials of Horror segment ever. There's just so much implied violence here. Since they obviously can't show the characters be killed, they will torment our imaginations by making us listen to Jimbo's death. It feeds into memories of how powerless you would feel as a kid in school, being scurried from one class to the next like cattle. Nightmare Cafeteria isn't nearly as funny as the first two segments, but totally makes up for it in creepiness. Also, Trials of Horror 5 has that closing song, which basically combines all three segments. It's an homage, has some sci-fi magic, and is grisly to look at. 
At least Groundskeeper Willie manages to survive this part. So there you have it. A Treehouse of Horror episode clocks its very first win in one of these countdowns. This was one of those where I knew what the top 9 would be, but it was a super close call on that number 10 spot. I ended up going with Bart's Girlfriend at number 18, Bart vs. Australia at 17, A Star is Burns at 16, and Two Dozen One Greyhounds at number 15. Then Lisa's Rival, followed by the PTA Disbands, followed by Itchy and Scratchy Land, with Bart of Darkness being the bubble episode. Honestly, I feel a bunch of these episodes would have made the Season 5 list, they just live in a very competitive neighborhood. Let me know in the comments what your favorite Season 6 episodes are and how you would rank them. Am I underrating the travel episodes? Am I overrating the emotional moments? Are the average episodes too average? Let me know what you think. Next on the agenda is the educational world of Season 7, where we learn the ins and outs of the food chain, the secret history of Jebediah Springfield, and the indisputable fact that the goggles do nothing. Also, we finally find out who shot Mr. Burns. I'm betting Smingers did it. As always, thanks for watching.